Hi, this is Andrew Wolf. In this video, um, I'm continuing my series on oncologic emergencies, and I'm going to be talking about cardiac tamponade. Okay, we have right in front of us the a very rough drawing of the heart, and you can see this is the right side of the heart. We've got the right atrium and the left atrium and the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Now, what happens with tamponade is um, so we've got the visceral and parietal pericardium here and with tamponade we end up getting fluid that begins to collect between the visceral and, and parietal pericardium. And you know what's interesting is if this collects very very slowly the uh, very fibrous parietal pericardium can actually stretch slowly over time. So you can end up with a patient that has um, a huge amount of fluid collected in the pericardial space. You know, I've seen patients with, with, you know, like 750 cc's in this relatively small space, and um, that does not have tamponade. Or you could have someone that only has a few tablespoons that is developing tamponade because it collected very, very quickly. So really, it sort of has to do not just with the size of the uh, of the pericardial effusion, but how quickly it accumulated. Okay. So why does this fluid accumulate? Well, it's not really well understood in all cases, but the theory is that there may be uh, micrometastasis in uh, the pericardial space itself, um, or there could be metastasis to the lymph nodes that are draining the pericardium, pericardial space that, um, that are disrupting the drainage uh, or, you know, sort of clogged lymphatics from tumor. Um, you know, the majority of time we will send, you know, we will take a sample, put a needle in and take a sample of fluid and send it to the pathology lab and the majority of time the pathology is negative malignant cells. Now that does not mean that the pericardial effusion wasn't caused by malignancy, it just means that you know we didn't find the malignant cells in the effusion. So again, you know, it may be that the malignant cells were not present in the pericardial space itself, but they were sort of causing the pericardial effusion by their presence just outside of the space, down, downstream from the pericardial space, if you will. So again, a pericardial effusion isn't necessarily, um, isn't always an emergency. Um, it becomes an emergency when it develops into tamponade. And it, we know that it's tamponade by looking at, um, by the symptoms known as Beck's triad, which is hypotension, jugular venous distension, and muffled heart sounds. Now, hypotension is due to a um, dramatic decrease in cardiac output from the left ventricle. So this is from decreased cardiac output. Um, jugular venous distension is is due to compression of the right atrium and right ventricle, which is um, disrupting uh, blood return back to the heart from the um, inferior vena cava. Um, and muffled heart sounds obviously is due to the large amount of fluid that's surrounding the heart and making it difficult for you to hear heart sounds. Now, another sign that, um, that you will all often see when you have a patient with cardiac tamponade is pulses paradoxes. Now this is important to understand because you know sort of understanding why this sign occurs um, helps to understand the whole pathophysiology behind uh, cardiac tamponade. Now say we have an, a patient that you know sort of Joe normal patient that has a blood pressure of 120 over 60. Now what's interesting is that during expiration Joe Normal's blood pressure is 120 over 60. But during inspiration, even if Joe Normal is normal and healthy, it may be as low as 110 
over 60. So even with a normal patient, it is normal to have a blood pressure that is up to 10 millimeters of mercury lower during inspiration than it is during expiration. Well, why is that? The theory is that there's two things going on here. When we take a deep breath, we uh, end up having a negative inspiratory force, or negative inspiratory pressure in our thoracic space. And this actually, so we have a negative pressure in our thoracic space, so the pressure in the inferior vena cava and the right atrium uh, becomes lower, and that increases blood return through. So I realize that I've been saying inferior vena cava, I mean superior vena cava, and obviously the inferior vena cava from down here. Um, through, through the vena cava, um, back to the right atrium, um, because of this increase uh, or decrease in pressure in the intrathoracic space. So this increases blood flow to the right side of the heart. So during inspiration, we have increased blood flow to the right side of the heart. But at the same time, inside our lungs, uh, we have very compliant capillaries. And the capillaries are um, the vessels in our lungs which contain the greatest volume of blood Within, our, uh, within the pulmonary vasculature. And when we take a deep breath, all of these capillaries increase in size, so we have increased volume for blood within the lungs. And this decreases blood flow back to the left side of the heart. And so we have decreased left ventricular filling during inspiration which decreases left ventricular stroke volume and decreases cardiac output on the left side, which then decreases blood pressure. So that is why with a normal patient that has nothing wrong with their heart, we still can see a slight difference in blood pressure, slightly lower blood pressure during inspiration than we do during expiration. Now, with a patient that has tamponade, this becomes even more pronounced because what happens is all of this fluid here in the pericardial space begins to compress in on the left and right ventricle and it actually begins to exert pressure. Okay, so we end up with smaller space and higher pressures in the right atrium and the right ventricle. So when we take a deep breath and we increase the, or we decrease the pressure in the intrathoracic space, we increase the blood flow to the right atrium and we increase the blood volume in the right atrium and the right ventricle. What happens is we actually shift the septum towards the left ventricle and decrease the size of the left ventricle even further than it. And this drops cardiac output significantly during inspiration. All right? And so oftentimes, you know, you'll see someone with a blood pressure and actually, you know, the, the blood pressure the left ventricle is already getting getting small because, you know, generally by this time we've got a circumferential pericardial effusion and we're already compressing in the left ventricle as well. Um, so cardiac output is already starting to drop. So what happens is, you know, typically you'll have a patient that comes in and tamponade and their pressures are already 90 over 40. And when they take a deep breath, it may drop 20 more points and you end up with a pressure of 20, 70 over 40. Now what's interesting is you know, typically if you get a pressure of 60 to 70, um, you 
oftentimes can't feel the pulse at all. So oftentimes when you are palpating their pulse, you will have the sensation that the pulse is completely ablated every time they take a deep breath. So sometimes the pulse's paradoxus is so pronounced and the pressures are already, already so low that you can even pick up pulse's paradoxus on physical exam without even checking the pressures. In fact, I noticed this the first time when I was a brand new nurse practitioner. Um, I had, was admitting a patient, uh, a cancer patient that was coming in um, with shortness of breath and chest pain and uh, you know I was going in to evaluate the patient and I was checking her pulse and I you know noticed it was it was you know she was tachycardic her pulse is a little bit thready and I noticed every time she took a breath her pulse would disappear so you know I went and got one of my more senior colleagues and I said you know what's going on I've never seen this before and uh, you know she kind of told me well this looks like pulses paradoxus and we checked her uh, we checked her pressures um, manually with a uh, blood pressure cuff and lo and behold that's exactly what was going on. So how do you manage a patient that has cardiac tamponade and um, you've noticed this Bex triad a patient that comes in um, with cancer that has hypotension uh, jugular venous distension, muffled heart sounds, and you may have noticed pulses paradoxus. Well, they need an emergent echocardiogram to evaluate. Now, sometimes, um, you know, a chest x-ray or CT scan of the chest may show an effusion, but it's really not going to be able to show a picture of, uh, you're not going to be able to rule out or rule in tamponade because you really need to have that video picture to show the tamponade physiology. Now, what's the treatment going to be? Well, you know, Pericardiocentesis um, can be done um, through a sub-xiphoid approach. Um, you know, I think I've seen some episodes of, of ER where they do it at the bedside blindly. Um, generally, that's not needed anymore because echocardiogram is so easy to get. Um, you know, there is a, a way to do it where you put a, uh, an EKG lead on the needle so that you can uh, detect when you're actually entering the pericardium. And, um, but generally, again, I've never seen this done at the bedside because it's so easy to get an uh, um, echocardiogram and actually do it under echo guidance. So even though I, I have some, you know, I work with some very skilled um, cardiologists, I've, I've never seen it done emergently without, uh, without uh, ultrasound or echo guidance. And then the other, uh, the other treatment modality is pericardial window. And according to my, uh, the thoracic surgeons that I worked with, um, a pericardial window with a sub-xiphoid approach um, actually doesn't really have significant benefits over um, a pericardial synthesis. Um, you know, a, peric a pericardial effusion can tend to uh, recur uh, at equal rates with either uh, with either types of treatment. So, anyways, those are the two uh, drainage types um, techniques that uh, that you can use. Both are equally effective, and uh, the fluid usually does not reaccumulate with either treatment. Okay, so that's my very brief uh, discussion of cardiac tamponade as an oncologic emergency, and I will see you in the next video.